People don't change jobs for money. They just don't. So understanding that it's the culture, it's the mission, it's the bigger picture buy-in is why they will leave a company to go join your company. If you can't sell that, and when I use the word sell, I don't mean convince. I don't mean trick. I mean, articulate your core values and your mission in a way that excites them. That's the sale. Most people have this blame on other people and I've been there too. And I think that's part of being young and growing up and realizing like, oh, am I the problem? It's like when you see somebody who all of their exes are crazy, right? Everybody right. knows somebody. All my exes are crazy. And then you realize, no, it's it's not all your exes. It's you. I wish people understood the difference between busy and productive. Oh, I'm working so hard. You're just busy. There's a big difference between being busy and being productive. And the day that you recognize that all activity is not the same, strategic activity is productivity. Hey guys, welcome to Thinking Bigger. I am here with Jeff Fenster of Everbowl. What's up, man? Thanks what's, for having me. What's up, Jeff? Thank you so much. Uh, we're up here at the Everbowl Studio or the Unevolved Studio, and it is awesome. Like you have a, <laughs> a setup here. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know the team. We spent uh, a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to to build it, but we're excited. It's it's been live for about three weeks now. We've been filming a ton in here, and it's it's been great. And we get to invite awesome people like yourself to come. We get to do your show here, so we can do the home and aways all in one location. And yeah. It's, Save some travel time. Yeah, seriously. I mean, especially because you're up in Vista and I'm in downtown San Diego. So for you, that would have been About like an hour. Yeah, two hours out of your day at least um, with travel and the podcast. So incredible. So for those of uh, the people that may not know you or Everbowl, can you let them know a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah. Background, um, <clears throat> law school sports agent at 24, but ultimately decided didn't want to pursue that career. So after turning down the job with Lee Steinberg Sports Agency, had to get a job because I had a fiance and a daughter and um, worked six months at ADP payroll company. Fortunately, I used my background is in sales and relationship capital, and I use a lot of those skills to uh, excel. Fortunately, I was the number one sales rep in the country out of 2000 sales reps, first to make President's Club. And I thought I was going to be a forever salesman and grow within the organization. And uh, life changed over the course of a uh, single day. I had earned a bonus for $17,000. And when I went to my boss in January of 2008 to get it, they told me I had to wait until the end of the fiscal year. And so I saw my future and I realized if I was going to stay in corporate America, I was going to have to always wait for these arbitrary dates that were defined by the company to get what I deserved. And I couldn't create my own, my, my own world, my own atmosphere. And so uh, I was really disheveled. You know, this was back in 08 before YouTube was really a thing and before entrepreneurship was even a, really a thing. And I went home and I told my fiance we had just moved into our new house about five weeks prior. And that was the house we were going to get married in. And I said, listen, I'd like to quit the job, sell the house and move you and our daughter into my mom and dad's house and start my first company, which was a direct competitor to where I was because I knew I could sell payroll. I didn't know how to run a payroll company. I didn't know how to run any company. And so fortunately, she was supportive. And so I did. I quit my job, sold the house, moved in with my mom and dad and fiance and daughter and convinced a buddy to leave ADP. And we started our first company in, in uh, March of 08 called iChecks and scaled it, turned into Canopy HR, and we sold it in 2011. Um, simultaneously, I started a recruiting agency that I sold in 2012. And then in 2012, I started a digital marketing agency. I partnered with Neil Patel, and we grew that and scaled it in 2015, sold the clients. I'm leaving out a few of my lessons or learnings, if you will, some companies that I started that didn't work out so well. And then in 2016, I started Everbowl, which is a craft superfood chain focusing on health and wellness and, and really addressing why we don't eat healthy. And so I reverse engineered the excuses we make to why we eat fast food 3.2 times a week and realized we don't eat healthy because either it costs too much to eat healthy, it doesn't fill us up and leave us satisfied, doesn't taste good, or we just can't get it. And so Everbowl was built to be affordable, filling, delicious, and accessible. And if we do that, we can convince everybody to make better choices and eat right. And so Everbowl started with that mission. Um, we started with one store in Poway, California. Today we have 60 open around the country and 310 more sold. So we'll be at 370 stores by 2026. Um, it's expensive to build restaurants. So I started a construction fabrication company called We Build. We build stuff and we actually build every single Everbowl. And as of last year, we started offering that service to other brick and mortar retail concepts, whether it's a restaurant or retail concept, any emerging brand that's looking to build the same concept again and again and again and again. And now we work with Shaquille O'Neal and build big chickens. We work with Drew Brees and build stretch zones. Um, we built a handful of other concepts that are emerging and Looking to grow and scale that as we move into 2023 and beyond. And then um, 
in 2017, superfoods are really expensive. And so to help drive the cost down, I started a company called Unevolved Products, where I went down to Brazil, started sourcing my own superfoods, started importing them, and then we started manufacturing our own flavors and having our own proprietary blends in our store, which was great as a differentiator, but simultaneously it created opportunity. And so when COVID hit in 2020, um, we started a direct-to-consumer launch with Unevolved Products. And so mm. partnered with QVC, got onto to the channel. QVC sold out in seven minutes. Uh, we ended up selling close to $8.5 million on QVC between 2020 and 2021, and we're named 2021 Plant-Based Product of the Year. And just recently, as you just alluded to at the beginning of the show, um, created this studio and just launched Unevolved Studios, where it's a content house that we're looking to build and scale. And those are the fun projects I've been working on. That's amazing. So when I, so I've listened to a couple of your interviews, just doing some research on you and talking to people that we mutually know. I've, hear, I've heard you talk a lot about the types of entrepreneurs people are. So I think a lot of people think that they have to be a number one guy. They have to start the company. They have to build. They have to be this, this overwhelming force of everything. And you sort of break it down to it not being that, right? So would you consider yourself more of a visionary, more of a operations guy? I see you as more of a visionary, big picture, starting and building things and then finding the people to fit the roles that maybe – are your weaknesses or don't match your strengths. What do you have to say about that? Uh, I agree. Yeah, no, I'm definitely not your operator. Um, I'm really good if we're sitting here today and an idea gets brought up and there isn't a company to do it or we think we can do it better. I'm really, really good at taking a concept from in my head or in your head or in our head, collective heads, building out what's necessary to get it to scale, getting it all the way through, and then building a team that can actually operate and take it to the next level. Right. And so to the point of what you said, I think that there is a clear distinction and that's where people get stuck because entrepreneurship has been glorified over the last handful of years, especially with social media. And so we have this world now where everyone thinks it's sexy to be a founder. Yeah. Like, oh, I need to go to college. Like now there's these schools of entrepreneurship where I speak at a lot, even live at San Diego State. And they're teaching everyone to start a company. What they failed, in my opinion, to, re uh, to deliver and what I think these students need to learn is starting a company is one skill. It's like being on a baseball team. There's only one starting pitcher, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean the second baseman isn't part of that team and isn't going to win a championship. And there are, there is such a uh, opportunity if people recognize where their role is that they can be part of a founding organization and be on an entrepreneur, be an entrepreneur on an entrepreneurial team, even if they're not employee number one. Right. They're employee number four, number five. Uh, my team is filled with them. I mean, the studio we're sitting in, like my COO, Eric Hansen, he's not the guy who probably is going to start the company, but he's definitely the guy who's going to take the idea w alongside whoever and make it exponentially better to a point that wouldn't probably happen without him. So he's just as much of an entrepreneurial mind as the person who started the company. It's just the skills are different because if you're not, for me, I'm, what I'm really good at is building a team, right. attracting the talent, building a culture, finding the resources, working with investors, delivering message to the street, sales, and all that front end stuff, which is very important for a startup. That If that's not your skill set, if you're an operational minded human, sales is not your bag. Investor relations is probably not your bag. Getting people to buy into your amazing concept, no matter how amazing it is, is probably not your bag. So you may fail as a founder because you couldn't bring in the money, you couldn't bring in the team, or you can't sell the product, even though your idea and your company was probably better than ones that are surviving. Right. And we all know shitty salespeople can can sell bad products. Yeah. Right. And it's a danger, right? And it's something that I've even had to learn throughout my years of selling is to not back and sell, manipulate, and use that skill in the wrong. Right. Because my goal is never to sell someone a bag of goods. Yeah. So together, we build a dream team. I'm nothing but my team. I'm not a solopreneur, which is another kind of entrepreneur, right? The solopreneur is someone who has a specific service that they're offering that they can deliver on 100%. They don't need anybody else. And it, a lot of times you see that in software. Like Zuckerberg was kind of a solopreneur for a while with Facebook. He could code the whole thing. He didn't need a, a sales and marketing arm. And it was such a revolutionary disruptive product. Right. It attracted everything on its own. But if he had to go out and deliver with his personality without that Facebook brain mind behind it, it wasn't going to work. Right. So I think that we are caught up right now in this world where we've glorified entrepreneurship instead of re recognizing that, no, 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 let's glorify the common mission 
and say, do you want to be part of a bigger company with all of the guardrails defined and you want to take a job and grow with inside a big bureaucracy and that's what you want and you're comfortable with? Or do you want to have more blank paper? Because in my company, if you want to work with me in the company I start, you better be entrepreneurial minded because I'm not giving you the roadmap. I'm not telling you this is how you have to do your job. I'm saying we're trying to go here. Your job is to figure out through your your uh, kind of role on the team how we get there. And as long as we all agree where we're going, we can build something incredible. And so I, I'm surrounded by entrepreneurial minds on my team. Right. And I'm just another entrepreneurial mind. I just happen to be the founding face. But it doesn't mean that I'm here on my own. Like, yeah. I, the, I'm nothing without the team behind me. Right. Yeah, that's excellent. And I think a lot of entrepreneurs want to kind of beat their chest and say, oh, I built this. I'm the top. I'm the face. I'm the man. But yeah, any company that I've built, because I built a couple that are nowhere near as successful as yours. But for me, when I've had a successful business, it's always come from leveraging other people's strengths and matching it with my weaknesses. Now, I want to circle back on something. You said that you do a lot of speaking at these entrepreneurial schools and colleges where they teach you to start a business. Would you say that if you're going to start a business and you're going to be that founder, you're going to be that starting person that starts the business, builds it, runs it, and then finds other people... If you don't have a sales or marketing background, specifically sales, do you think that's why most businesses fail? Yes. I think what everyone fails to realize is sales is the most important skill in business. Right. Even if you're just an employee at a big company, if you can't sell your idea to your manager, supervisor, or superiors, your skills to your manager, superiors, or, or, um, or superiors, then when the promotion's up, how are you going to sell yourself to get it? Right. How are you going to sell your idea to move your department forward? How are you going to sell others to buy into that same idea? Sales has gotten a bad rap. Sales has become this thing where everyone thinks it's, or the common misconception is that sales is this idea that I'm selling you a product or service. It's not. Sales is the ability to articulate the value in whatever it is that you're discussing in a clear, concise manner and create buy-in. I want you to buy into whatever it is. So if, if we're talking politics, I'm selling you my idea. If we're talking sports and we're arguing who's the best player, I'm selling you my idea. If I'm negotiating with my my 11-year-old to clean her room, yeah. I'm selling her on why she needs to do that. <clears throat> Sales is something we all do every day. What separates, and I, in, in my opinion, what separates and gives huge advantages to the founding entrepreneurs are the ones who are really good at that skill. Right. Because when you're <clears throat> building a company, unless you are completely self-funding it, and it is going to not require employees and culture, and you don't need to work with suppliers and vendors, Yeah, then you don't need to really sell anything. Right. But most companies don't fall into that bucket. Most companies, you need to raise money at some point. Yep. You need to go sell your product or service. You need to buy, uh, convince people to join your team. And when you want to convince people to join your team, the one thing I learned when my recruiting agency, and this was the biggest lesson I learned in, in starting the recruiting agency. So I started a recruiting agency in 2008. Because I had a payroll and HR company, and I started that in 08 as well. In the first four months, I was doing great, and then the Great Recession happened. And when that happened, companies really stopped hiring. And they stopped hiring for two reasons. Number one, the unemployment pool was excessively large. So going through a stack of resumes this big just was incredibly difficult. And two, no one was leaving jobs. If you had a job during 08, 09, and 10, for a while, everyone was so afraid that if I leave this job... I, you know, I'm, what could happen, right. right? It was so hard to get a new one. So no one was leaving. So it was hard for me to start selling payroll services to these companies that were actually shrinking. And I realized that I could sell, I could sell new clients or I could help my clients grow. Mm. So I started a recruiting agency <clears throat> to, to vertically integrate it into, into iChecks at the time to really help my current customers expand their team. And what I learned is, and I thought, oh, this is going to be so easy. I want Kevin to come work for, my, for one of my client's companies. Let's just pay him more money. That's not why people leave jobs. Right. It took me to that moment to learn until I had my own company to realize people don't change jobs for money. They just don't. Yep. So understanding that it's the culture, it's the mission, it's the bigger picture buy-in is why they will leave a company to go join your company. If you can't sell that, and when I use the word sell, mm. I don't mean convince. I don't mean trick. I mean articulate your core values and your mission in a way that excites them. Yeah. That's the sale. It's not a transactional sale. I don't do transactional sales. I'm not someone who's going to knock on doors and say, hey, this is Jeff. Do you want to buy this, you know, this gadget? And then once you say yes, I never see you again. Right. I don't do that. 
I do relationship-based selling, which means we want, when you buy something or do something with me, it's forever. Mm -hmm. And my plan is to come back to you again and again and again. And the way I'm able to do that is, is I identify what are the problems that you have and what solutions can I offer you that are going to improve your life, improve your company, and provide enough value where you don't feel like you bought anything from me. You think I gave you value. Yep. If I do that, I'm successful. And that's what I try to do with my culture here is I try to bring people in and say, come join because you get to be an entrepreneur with me. Yeah. You get to build your department as you see fit. You get to fail as many times as you want as long as you don't fail on the same thing twice. Failure is great. Let's fail our way to success. What I don't like is when we make the same mistakes over and over because we're not learning. Mm. But let's find all the ways that don't work until we find the ones that do. I create an atmosphere that is based off my core values and I'm clear on them, which means if you come work with me, you understand my core values and the company's core values. At all my companies, the first two rules are make friends and have fun. Right. That's it. There's no distinction from that. So if you're not someone who's interested in making friends and having fun, you're not going to want to come work with us. Yeah. Just simple. Yeah. Right? And then from there, the other three core values at the company and mine are close enough where you can say, do I identify with this? Is this something that is, in, that is going to excite me every day to show up and be part of this team? Is the mission something I stand with? If you're someone who believes in eating McDonald's four times a week and smoking cigarettes and never exercising and the amount of exercise for you is literally dialing a phone and you don't believe in health and wellness, you're not going to want to work with me. Right. And I'm not going to convince you because that's bad for you. It's bad for me and it's never going to work. So we're going to have high turnover, which we don't. And so I'm not able to build the company. And so I think as I'm talking to these aspiring entrepreneurs and people who are, are current entrepreneurs and they say, you know, I'm struggling with all these things. When I talk to them really quickly you can identify if they are strong in that. And if they're not, that's okay. Because right. you can have an idea for a big company, but you need to hire someone like myself who is strong in the areas that you're weak and lose the ego and say, look, you see it sometimes. Like Some of the best companies you see, founder and COO. And then you see CEO. And what does that tell you? That tells you that that individual realized right away, I have a great idea for a company, but I'm not the face. Yeah, I'm not the person who's going to take it that way. And then there's other people who are founding faces and have those skills, but they have too big of an ego to recognize that they need to have a team around them that may get more credit than they will for a lot of things. Right. So what? Yeah. Credit doesn't pay bills. Oh, that's good. And I think that you come from not only a place of service, but a place of gratitude. And it's funny because obviously you're coached by David Meltzer, so you, <laughs> you have a lot of those uh, things, but you, you also come from a place of abundance, right? So most people don't want people to feel like, entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs inside of their business, meaning when they hire people, they want to control them, they want to keep them in a box. And it seems like you don't do that. A lot of your stuff comes from uh, service to others mm -hmm. and then also abundance. Well, it started with the payroll company. So when I was 24, I started my first company and we had a lot of success. Uh, we ended up raising private equity uh, capital. We ended up opening an office in Orange County. It was a payroll and HR company. So I'm dealing with HR departments. I'm dealing with tends to be a little bit of an older demographic of, of individuals. Yep. And I was this, you know, I'm a young looking 24 year old. I look like a kid, right? And I'm around 40s and 50s, people in their 40s and 50s. And I really felt insecure about it. And I did exactly what you just said. I was very much like, I have to exert my level of control. I have to let everyone know, no, I'm the brains behind this thing. I'm, I deserve to be the CEO of this company. Right. And as a result of that, I lost a ton of great talent. Mm. And they kept walking out the door. And I kept blaming them. Ah, you know, no conviction, no loyalty. They don't understand. They don't understand. Well, about a year and a half goes by, and so many great people left. And I actually hired this director of sales, and he was really good. I mean, he was really good. And finally, he left. And when he left, on the way out, I said to him, his name is Dave, and I said, uh, Dave, do you mind me asking, like, really, why'd you leave? And he's like, he gave me some bullshit answer. And I was like, no, no, no. Like, I really want to know. And he said, do you want to know the truth? And he goes, yeah. I was like, yeah. He's like, you're suffocating me. You're not letting me be me. And when he left, that really hit me. So I spent a little bit of time. First, I, first I ignored it. And I said, yeah, you know, he doesn't <laughs> always. You. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, you're crazy. But then I had an office in Orange County and an office in San Diego. So that's one of the reasons I moved to San Alejo Hills is because my office on Miramar Road and an office in Irvine, it was like in between. Yeah. So I'm doing the drive up the five up to my office in Irvine. And I just had this real, final realization. I'm like, you know what the common denominator in all these people? 
me. Mm. Me. And it took a little bit of learning to, you know, self-learning and self self humility to realize that I was the problem. I'm pushing people away. Instead of attracting them, I'm pushing them away. And why am I pushing them away? Because I'm forcing them to do it my way. And my way might be the best way, but it might not be. And you know what else? Just because my way is the best way to me, there's many ways to do things. Ask someone to tie a shoe. Mm. There's lots of ways to tie a shoe. There's lots of ways to crack an egg. Mine in my head might be the most efficient, but the day I realize that if I want to attract world-class talent, and I mean world-class, yep. world-class talent is not coming because I need to tell them how to do their job. They're right. world-class because they're world-class. And the best analogy is baseball, and I'm a baseball player, and you look at everyone's baseball swing, it's all different. At point of contact, it's all the same, but everyone has their own style. Yeah. And so I realized instead of kind of suffocating everybody and pushing them away, I'm going to do the opposite, and I'm going to be more on the... I'm bringing you on our team, Kevin, because I think you're world class. I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. If I did, you're the wrong hire. Mm. I need you to be excellent. I'm going to create an ecosystem for you. My job is to give you the resources and tools you need to succeed. All I need you to do is buy into that. We're all agreeing where we're going. So if we're all agreeing we're, we're you know, boating to Hawaii and I want to head directly in a direct line and you want to go up by, up by San Francisco before you head over because you think it's the best approach, that's fine. As long as we all agree we're going to Hawaii, I want to create an environment that does that. And the day that I did that, all my companies exploded and I was able to attract incredible talent. Well, it's incredible that you actually realize that it was you, right? <laughs> and most people have this blame on other people. And I've been there too. And I think that's part of being young and growing up and realizing like, oh, am I the problem? Maybe I'm causing all these issues in my life. It's like when you see somebody who all of their exes are crazy, right? Everybody right. knows somebody. All my exes are crazy. And then you realize, no, it's it's not all your exes. It's you, you know? So that's really good. I think having the humility to understand that um, taking blame is a superpower. It is. It's freeing. Um, it's not easy. It was not easy for me. I can assure you I spent many days blaming everybody else. Um, wondering what is wrong with these people? How do they not see the vision that we're after? Yeah. You know, and I'm working 18 hour days and killing myself. So my tolerance for less than their best was zero. Mm -hmm. But what I failed to recognize in it, and you say it's good that I realized it took a lot of learnings to get there. I wish I would have found it sooner. Yeah. If I could go back and talk to my young self, you know, I'll be 40 in two weeks. So no way. Yeah. Oh, so dude, you look so young. That's respect. crazy. Thank I you. mean it too. Like, <laughs> wow. Um, I'm older now, so I'm able to go back. But if I could go back, I feel like I would have added millions of dollars to 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 the exit faster. Yeah. Had I not pushed away some of the amazing humans I pushed away. And I think I'd be better. You know, we're always trying to get better uh, as executives, as leaders, as people. And so, you know, at this point in my life, I'm I'm focused a little bit more on that radical humility and understanding, hey, how can I get better? If I get better, then good. But I can tell you. If you don't have incredible people working around you and you feel like they keep leaving, chances are you're doing something that's pushing them away. Like I couldn't go work for someone who didn't give me the freedom. Like if I'm going to come work for somebody and someone's like, you know, I'm, I've been paid over the years to do some consulting work and hey, help me build this or leverage. If you try to tell me how to do it, I don't want your money. Yeah. I don't need it. I'm good. But if you say, hey, Jeff, this is my problem. I'm going to give you some money to solve this problem. Solve it how you see fit. Great. That's an environment I can even thrive in and work in. Right. I'm curious. So you sound like sort of a rebellious thinker, right? <laughs> you think outside of the box, not in it. And I, for me, I'm the same way. I think that, and one reason why I admire you and look up to you so much is because I think that we have similar ways of thinking. Now, I'm wondering if we share this. When I was in high school and when I was in elementary school and my whole life, I've always been not necessarily anti-authority because when you know your role, you know your role. But I think when somebody tries to demand something of you, like school, right? No, you're going to learn math. Mm. I fucking hate math. Why am I going to learn math, right? Were you a good student? Were you rebellious through school? Or I'm curious. Well, so full disclosure, I have Jewish parents. So school was not a requirement. Uh, school was not a request. Yeah. Um, I had to get good grades. So yes, I, ha I, I found the easiest path for me to get good grades. I wouldn't call myself a rebellious thinker. And I wouldn't say I don't like the box. Yeah. My issue has always been I don't see the box. Mm. And that's where I have struggled in controlled environments is because where others see a box or say, why don't you just follow the damn rules? 
I don't understand them, so I can't follow them. Mm-hmm. And it's not on purpose, and I don't want to be that way. Um, it's just kind of how I see the world. I just don't get like, because it was always done is not an answer for me. Right. I want to understand why. I don't want to do things the way it's always been done. I think that that is how mediocrity is, is created. Yep. And so four minute mile is the greatest example of that. Everyone said it, you can't run a mile in under four minutes until someone did. And once they did, then everyone did it. Why? Right. Because Roger Bannister, right? Roger Bannister. That's right. Great story. So in that same vanity, in that same, you know, in that same line, for me, it's just always been like, I don't get why there's a box and why you're asking me to do it a specific way. I'm open to it. I'm not like, oh, don't touch it. It's hot. So I'm going to go step my hand on it. Like I'm going to respect the fact that I don't want to pay the dummy tax and learn from others. Yeah. But if I don't agree with the process, if I don't agree with the approach, I'm going to challenge it and I'm going to challenge it immediately. And I'm not going to be the guy who's just going to be like, well, that's just the way they told me I had to do it. So, but yes, I did get good grades. I did understand the power of education. Um, I didn't necessarily do as good learning the information. I was very efficient at, at school. I learned really quickly that I could pile a ton of information in my head to pass the exam with a good grade. Yeah. But then ask me the next week any of it, and I probably don't remember much of it. So I don't, I didn't retain a lot of it. But yeah. And that's why school never made sense to me because they weren't really m- more focused on you learning and applying stuff. They were more focused on shaping you to be somebody without free thought, right? And, that, and that's just how I feel. And I think that education is absolutely critical. And I know that you spend two hours a day educating yourself on mm-hmm. something. And there's a difference between educating yourself and being forced to do something so that somebody else can benefit from you, right? You're a resource, you're an asset to somebody else. That's what I didn't like growing up. So let's talk about your commitment to excellence and your commitment to getting better every single day. I know that you used to, you started out with four minutes Mm -hmm. of learning something new every day, but now uh, as of three years ago in an interview, you said two hours. Yep. So tell me about that. I don't listen to music. I spend a lot of time in my car. Um, I don't, have an issue with music. I just find that I don't need to, if I'm going to tune out from the world, I'm going to spend time with my kids, uh, my wife. For me, it's, I use windshield time as learning time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm about efficiency and maximizing. And what people don't understand about learning is learning is how all the opportunities present themselves because you don't know what you don't know until you know it. And you don't know how that piece of information will or won't help you. So I'm not the guy who's going to learn to mastery so I can start, you know, like for example, a couple of years ago, the guy who did a lot of our branding spent a ton of time in Photoshop. And I'm like, man, there's so many tools in Photoshop. Like if I could just get a basic understanding. So I bought Photoshop. I asked him to spend some time with me. And for literally about a month and a half, every morning I was screwing around in Photoshop. I still suck at Photoshop, but now I understand what can be accomplished in Photoshop. Yep. Sometimes it drives my team crazy because I think it's easier than it is or yeah. faster than it, it than it should be. Um, but ultimately, that learning has enabled me to now see the world through a different lens and understand. And part of my real strength is relationship capital and how I make friends with as many humans as possible. What is the easiest way to make friends with someone? Get make involved smile. and get involved in a conversation. Right. If I know something that is really passionate, you're pa- if you're passionate about Photoshop because you're a branding expert, and I have a elementary education on it where I can talk a little bit about it, and I've played with it and fumbled with it and have done things, we can have a conversation. Yeah. And immediately find common ground. So by me spending that windshield time learning all these different things, like right now I've been learning about ChatGPT and reading stuff about it, not because I ever plan on really figuring out how I'm going to use it. I don't necessarily know. I'm sure it's going to impact my life, but I need to understand it because it's a hot topic. Yeah. It's what's trending in the world right now. TikTok. I have a full disclosure. I, I post on TikTok, but I don't do it myself. I have someone who does that for me and I don't really understand TikTok, but there's a huge debate on should it be banned. You know, whether or not I have an opinion on that is, is, is irrelevant. I want to understand why is there such a big debate? What's going on? What's going on in the world? I want to be present. I want to be relevant. I want to be able to communicate with humans. I want to improve that. And so the two hours I spend a day learning is because if you are not learning things and expanding that knowledge base, you're only going to make friends with the same kind of people you've always made friends with. And I want to be able to walk into any social circle and get involved in any conversation and be able to talk intelligently about anything. That's what I want to be. So that learning is what allows me to do that. And by doing that, I make friends in different social circles. I make friends with different kind of uh, 
perspectives and how people see the world in different groups. And then that allows me to figure out opportunities that may benefit my companies, myself or others through that social network. Right. Right. So there's a meaning, there, there's an ends to the a means to the end. Let me say yeah. that better. Yeah, there's yeah. a means to the end uh, as to why. But it is always, it also is great because I get smarter, right? Like learning as a kid sounds the worst thing in the world. Yeah. Now I wish I knew everything. I wish I had a photographic memory. Do you know how many cool conversations I could get into if I had a photographic memory? You know, but like I ask a lot of questions. Like we were talking pre-show just about your background and I ask a lot of questions. I want to know. I want to understand. I want to learn. I want to hear. I want to get exposed. I want to hear why things work and don't work. I want to hear, you know, wins and losses from other people. It's all experience. I don't know if I'm going to ever use it. I don't care. I want to learn. So, yes, I try to spend two hours a day learning. Um, I try to watch documentaries. If I'm going to watch TV, I try to watch. Yeah, I love documentaries. I love re, uh, all true stories, even if they're, fit, you know, not a documentary, but it's actors portraying based on a true story. Yeah. I love all those. Yeah. I mean, all of them. I mean, if there's one of them out there, I'll watch it. Um, I just like that stuff. And, you know, my favorite show is The Men Who Built America. It's a fantastic series. If you haven't seen it, it is, I mean, it's, it'll, it'll knock your hair back. Like it, okay. it's really, really amazing. It's just the story about some of the pillars of America and it goes into Vanderbilt and it goes into Carnegie and it goes into Rockefeller and it goes into Ford and JP Morgan and how they built their companies at such pivotal times in our country's history and how right. the whole country got shaped as a result of it. The next one is the food that built America and the cars that built America. And they're all incredible. Yeah. But those things just fascinate me and learning that how these real, real pioneers did what they did because that's kind of what an entrepreneur is. You know, my main way that I make money in this world is I'm a problem solver. Mm. And how do you solve problems? By having the right tool to solve the problem. And I don't need to fumble my way through it. I, I like to learn. So it becomes addicting. It becomes your music. Yeah. I And I really love your, again, commitment to excellence. But one thing that sticks out that most entrepreneurs don't do, especially if they're good at building teams, is they will hire a team. Let's just say, like for me, when I hired Carlos, my media guy, Carlos is going to edit all the content that I put up. He sets up cameras. He runs the whole podcast, right? He edits all the videos. He shoot, he does it in Premiere Pro. Well, when Carlos was learning Premiere Pro, because I hired him as kind of a starter and said, you're passionate about this? Go learn it. I learned it with him because I need to know what's capable. And like you said, when, and I struggle with it too, You know, sometimes not knowing it well <laughs> enough to know that things are not as fast as I want them to be, but understanding what's capable and being able to call somebody out. So Bradley used a reference where he has a tech company. They have a software and he wants, he doesn't know code, but he knows that he needs to learn code so that if somebody is milking a project because they're making money off of it, he wants to be able to know enough to say, hey, are you doing this right? Or are you just taking advantage of me? I think that's a really big superpower that most people don't invest their time into now, I'm curious, how about wasted time? Do you think that most people waste time? Oh, for sure. I think most time is wasted. Um, even when we don't realize we're wasting it, we spend so much time being busy. Mm. And, you know, I just I just launched uh, my broadcast channel on Instagram where I share my thoughts and inspiration for the day. And it's great because in a way it's like journaling. Um, I don't care if anyone reads it. It's just for me. But... Um, Ultimately, one of my thoughts the other day is this idea that I wish people understood the difference between busy and productive. Oh, I'm working so hard. You're just busy. There's a big difference between being busy and being productive. And the day that you recognize that all activity is not the same, strategic activity is, product, is productivity. Busy activity is just busy. And you could spend a lot of time being busy without moving the needle at all. And without understanding what you need to do. So the easiest thing to, let me say that better for everyone, to take strategic action and be strategically active so you're being productive, you have to have a follow-through plan, a plan that says, this is what I'm going to do step by step by step by step. And I usually, I like to start at the end and work backwards. So if I want to get up the mountain, I say, okay, this is the mountain I want to get up to. Let's start there, work all the way back so I know where my first step's going to be and use a formula. And I believe all success is formulaic. The reason I've been successful is I understand a success formula that works for me and I'm able to apply it regardless of what I do. 
I guarantee you I will be successful at anything I try, not because I'm special. I'm an ordinary, regular guy. I don't have incredible intelligence or anything special that is so unique. But I figured out what extra things I need to do to generate extraordinary results, and I can repeat it again and again and again because I have the formula. And that's basically the premonition or the, the pretense of my show, The Jeff Fenster Show, where I interview successful humans, and we talk about their successes and their success formula. And that's what that's all about because if we can – help everyone figure out their success formula, everybody can be successful. And success for one person is obviously what that means is something different for everybody. It's not always financial. It's sometimes it's in relationships. Sometimes it's in health and wellness. Sometimes it is financial and business. Sometimes it's just their job. Sometimes it's religious, mm. right? It doesn't matter. Whatever success means for you, but repeating that formula over and over and over again allows success to happen. And it takes chance out of it. It takes luck out of it. It takes circumstance out of it. It ensures it. Like two plus two is four. And you know, you said you hate math. I I hated going through math, but yeah. I love math. Yeah. Because math is clear. And when I like to keep things simple, that's part of my success formula. When things are too complicated, it's very hard. So let's simplify things down to its most dumbest er, elementary way. Two plus two is four. Great. So if I need four, let's find two of those and two of those. Success is the same way. Let's figure that out. And that's that's been the, the model. That's great. And I love how you follow formulas because you think of it as math. And I think I share that I actually don't dislike math. I dislike the learning and yes. not getting it right away, you know, because there's nothing better than figuring out a tough math problem or a tough problem in general. But you mentioned that you don't like the people that you work with to make the same mistake twice. And I think a lot of people don't follow a formula or they don't realize when they have a formula that's not working. So if somebody's been in business for a while or they're doing anything in their life where they're consistently not getting results that they want, right? They're not happy. They're at a job that they don't like. They never leave it, but they're still following that formula. So of course, that's the answer they're going to get. What advice do you have somebody? What do you what advice do you have for somebody that maybe is following the wrong formula? Well, I think at first, start looking in the mirror. Right? It's the same thing when I was pushing talent away. So I have this model I do when things aren't working. I follow the stop, drop, and roll, kind of like when there's a fire in the house. So stop what you're doing immediately. By drop, I mean literally drop everything that you've been thinking about doing or that every plan you have and say, okay, we're going to start over. Grab a uh, completely blank, ple uh, blank piece of paper. And then what I ex one exercise I like to do is I like to say to myself, this is the problem I think I have, but if I change the inputs, if I change the information, could the problem go away, right? So sometimes rethinking about the problem in a different way. Example, Everbull, when I built my first restaurant, it cost me almost $300,000, and I was self-funding them, and I was going to build 100 of them. Well, that's a lot of money, so I don't want to spend $300,000 to build it. So problem, restaurants cost too much money. What did most people do? They run and solve the problem, and it's a repeatable problem, so I'm going to keep running out of money every time I build these restaurants. Restaurants fail, you lose all this money, now you were talking about how you once started a restaurant and it didn't work. Well, what if I reduce the cost of building a restaurant? Does that problem still exist? Well, no, it won't cost 300 grand. If I can do it for 100 grand, now I have different problems. How do you build restaurants for 100 grand? <laughs> but the cost problem is gone. Right. Right? So I rethought of the problem differently. So if you're running into the same mistakes, the same problems, and you're not thinking from a formulaic side, and you've been in business this long, stop what you're doing, Drop the same model that you've been following and roll into a new one. And if you don't know what to do, mentorship and coaching is great. Um, reach out. You can reach out to me. You can reach out to you. You can reach out to anyone who's been successful in something that you're interested in. We are big believers of that in my company. You know, radical humility is not something that just means lose the ego. I ask for help too. Uh, you know, we, we were building this studio. We talked to an expert in Australia about technology and these pieces of equipment because we don't need to figure it out the hard way. Right. I'm happy to be a beginner. I love to be a beginner. So does my team. We're, we're not afraid to say, we don't know what to do. Let's bring in experts who do. And if you're not willing to invest money into that, because you're right, you can call certain people and say, hey, I want some help. You know, you can call Gary Vaynerchuk. He's not just going to spend his day with you. Right. You write him a check for a million dollars, he'll fly to wherever you are and probably spend the day with you. Now, you don't have a million dollars, so maybe Gary Vaynerchuk's not the right guy. But there's men and women out there who are successful in whatever field you're working on or struggling through that you can either pay or volunteer time or find a way to be around where they're going to add value and help you rethink your formula, your process, your problem. And all it takes is one great idea or one great pivot 
and the entire business can change. One great introduction. Yeah. And I think that people try to do so much on their own and they don't think of asking for help or they don't know how to ask for help. But at the end of the day, if you want something, you have to go find somebody that has that. So when I first moved to San Diego, I had no network here. I didn't know anybody, but I did have the background of sales and marketing with this company Beacon Payments that I worked at. Well, what I realized was I had made money selling actually ADP's (laughs) payroll service too. Uh, But I had made money doing that, and I realized there was a formula that the owners of the company were following. So I knew their story, and I tried to emulate it, right? I followed that formula. So I went out. I found somebody who is a mutual friend of ours, Dan Fulkerson, and I realized this guy makes good money. He's here in San Diego, seems to be on the same vibe. And I asked him for help, right? Like, it's that simple. Find somebody that has what you want and follow what they're doing. Do you agree? Absolutely. Um Absolutely. You know, the model at ADP was 55 and two. Make 50 calls a week. You'll set five appointments. You set five appointments. You'll close two deals. You'll make President's Club. It was written for you. Do you know how many reps actually made 50 calls a week? 3%. Mm. That's why only 3% made President's Club. It's not like you have to be better than everyone else to achieve these. So what I what did I do to become the number one rep in the country? I made 150 calls a week. I tripled the model. It was laid out for me. And I had great relationship capital and I used, I started to think smarter. But when I first started, I was making 150 calls a week. I was actually setting 17 to 18 appointments a week. And I had a higher close ratio because I'm naturally a little bit better and I had honed the skill and I made presence club. And then I started using relationship capital and some friends that made warm introductions. So now I didn't even have to make the cold calls and my close rate went even higher. Right. But just follow the model. That's the problem. The information is there. It's never been easier to learn how to do anything. YouTube can teach you anything. It's a free education. You don't need a college degree. You don't need to go to Harvard. You don't even need to call a mentor or a guru. You can literally learn everything online, and most of us share our information. You can learn from people who are just broadcasting it out on every social media channel out there. The negative is there's so much information. Which one do you follow? And we bounce around like yo-yos. We don't stick to any model and give it time. It's like when you plant a seed, and when you plant a seed in the ground, first the the roots, they, they grow down. So if you're sitting at the top, and you're looking at where you planted your seed, you don't see anything because roots grow down first to build a solid foundation. Then eventually it sprouts and it breaks the earth. And so often we dig up that plant and change plans because we didn't see it sprout out of the earth. We don't think it's working. Mm -hmm. We don't see the roots being built down below. Follow the plan. Follow the formula. If you don't know the formula, find the formula. Reach out and ask for help. And if you're too embarrassed or you don't have the relationships, I get hit up on social media 25, 30 times a week from people. 23 out of the 25 are the worst things in the world. They're like, hey, can I pick your brain for 10 minutes? Or, hey, Jeff, love your content. Can I pick your brain for 10 minutes? Well, unfortunately, I don't have time to say yes to all those. Some of them actually do it very smartly. And they are creative in their approach, and you can tell they're genuine, and they're willing to invest their time. Hey, can I come spend time at your office, and when you have five minutes, can I borrow five minutes of your time? But that's an appropriate way to ask someone. Because now it's not like you're asking me to change my whole schedule to help you and you're not even offering me anything of, of value. Right. I'm happy to help when I can, but I can't stop running my company and doing all the things I'm doing just to help everybody. Unfortunately, I'm, I don't have that, that schedule. Um, so don't be afraid to ask, but think about it. Follow and get engaged in their content first if that's what they're doing. If they have a company, get involved in their company. I mean, you showed up, we met today, you're wearing my hoodie. Yeah. I mean, that was awesome. Unevolve. Right. First thing I said is nice hoodie. And what did you say? I went to Everbull yesterday because we were going to meet today. Do you know how often I've done people's podcasts and they've never had Everbull? Yeah. And I'm just a guest to fill a schedule that they're on. Right. I can tell. And I'm like, well, this is going to be a shitty interview because I'm not interested and you're not interested. Yeah. Versus taking the time to be interested in the human you're about to talk to and see how we can both add value to each other's lives. I now know you've been to Everbull. You support the brand. Yep. You support my mission. I'm wearing an Everbull shirt too. So we're yep. naturally just doing it. And Immediately, there's a connection. So if you're going to reach out to, you know, to someone cold on social media or through LinkedIn or you have a way to get in touch with them, don't do it the way everyone else does it with the bare bones minimum. Spend some time and do your homework if you really want the information. Show that you care and show that it's valuable to you and you'll get the results back. That's incredible. And yeah, I mean, that's it. Just follow the formula, you know? And um, so you've got some interesting stuff that you're working on now. So um, you have... 
your The Jeff Fenster Show, right? Yep. And then your book is coming out on the 19th of April? Uh, I think it's slated on the 18th of April. Okay. It's, the, it's called Relationship Bank Account. Um, it's actually based off of a course I was hired to do for LinkedIn. So LinkedIn hired me to do two entrepreneurship courses. Uh, it's all available in the LinkedIn Learning Library. So if you're a premium member, you can watch it for free. They have an incredible database, kind of like Netflix for learning. Uh, it's called LinkedIn Learning. Most people don't know it even exists, and they're premium LinkedIn members. There's thousands and thousands of videos on there on all topics. So you don't even have to just watch mine. But if you're interested in relationship capital, um, that course really d- provides tactics and, t- and tips and tricks that I've used to build my relationship capital. And I think it's very influential and helpful. And then one on marketing, no marketing money, no problem. Well, the relationship course turned into a book. And I'm excited because I was never thought I'd be an author, but my first book's coming out. So uh, if you'd like to to down, uh, download it off of, you know, Audible or um, one of the ebook platforms or Amazon. You can buy it, soft cover, hard cover. It's coming out, I think, on the 18th of April. And then the Jeff Fenster Show, we've been interviewing a ton, and that will go live the following week. And that show is actually all based on our topic that we talked about today, which is helping everyone understand success. Mm. Because the number one question I get asked is, hey, Jeff, you've been successful in all these different niches. Help me. Like, I'm struggling. How do I get success? And success is like this white ghost that we're all, tra- you know, that white unicorn we're all chasing. And I simplify it. And so my goal is to interview incredible humans, reverse engineer what made them successful again and again and again. And so we as an audience in the community can better understand this is a success formula used by most successful people. What are those traits and how do I work on those traits, right? If you struggle with commitment and that's one of the traits you see from every successful person, well, guess what? Your job is to work on improving your ability to commit and commitment or consistency, or tenacity, or perseverance, or sales, or whatever we're going to learn together through the Jeff Fenster Show. And so highly recommend you tune into that. That's going to be fun and exciting. And that should be launching live to, to the world the, the following week, uh, the 24th, I think, of April. Awesome. Yeah, everybody, please, if you're watching this, if you're listening to this, I need you to go follow Jeff on Instagram. Uh, Instagram is where you're most active, you'd yep. say? Okay. Yep. At Fenster Jeff. And not only follow him on Instagram, but subscribe to his new broadcast channel, which is a new thing Instagram's doing. Uh, I wake up every morning and read it first thing because it's the first thing that pops up. And it's actually the only broadcast channel I follow. And it's like he said, he kind of uses it as a journal and it's more for him to just get out there. But if you're willing to show up simply and read one thing every morning, I'm telling you this little tiny couple sentences is going to change every single day. And that will help you get 1% better every day. Uh, so everybody, follow Jeff. Uh, go ahead and get his book. Follow his new show as well. And uh, drop a comment if you liked this. And guys, thank you so much for listening to Thinking Bigger with Kevin Feely. Jeff, thank you so much for having us at your studio, which is insane. And thanks for being an amazing guest. Well, thank you for having me, man. This was awesome. Dude.